Number 10, lack of imagination. Bobby is actually one of the most powerful mutants in the Marvel Universe, and yet people might not always think of him first when it comes to some of the most powerful mutants around. This could be because what often holds Robert Drake back is his own imagination. It turns out Iceman has actually been capable of accomplishing insane feats with his powers, which we've only begun to see in more recent years. He can create sentient ice golems and change not only his own form from ice to water, but others as well. So what has prevented him from doing this in the past? Apparently his lack of imagining that he could. This fact also makes me wonder if this is true for other mutants apart from Bobby. Could all mutants be a lot stronger if they were just a little bit more creative? And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, be sure to show us you love us by clicking that subscribe button and don't forget to turn on that that bell notification so you don't miss out on any nerdy content. Number nine, drying out. I'm so glad this is no longer a weakness. For a while there, Aquaman had to be submerged in water periodically, otherwise he would literally dry out. He would also get weaker the longer he was away from water, and of course could even die if he was permanently kept out of water for long enough. And I believe this started affecting him after like an hour of being out of water. Not a lot of time. Number eight, bug spray. Yep, there have been times when Spider-Man was actually targeted and almost successfully defeated with, you guessed it, bug spray. Because he is a mutate, having had his genes in essence spliced with that of the radioactive spider who bit him, Spider-Man has both the strengths and in some cases the weaknesses of a spider. This not only includes a weakness to bug spray, but also a weakness to cold environments as well. In fact, if you used enough bug spray, you could even permanently defeat Peter Parker by ending his life. That's right, bug spray isn't just a nuisance for Spider-Man, it can actually be downright deadly. Elbow chloride specifically is the substance that Spider-Man finds himself weakened by. When exposed to the substance, it weakens Spider-Man, draining him of his powers and threatening his very life. Number seven, yellow. The color yellow has to be up there as one of the weirdest weaknesses that we have in comics. For a good long while, this was a weakness shared by all Green Lanterns. Especially odd when you consider just how powerful Green Lanterns are considered to be. So why were they weakened by a color? Well, while definitely silly on paper, it actually has to do with the rich history of Green Lantern lore. Green Lantern's opposing emotional color, you see, was yellow, which represents fear in the world of the cosmic emotional spectrum. Because green represents willpower, of course, the only thing that could undermine their abilities would be the emotion of fear. This was also inherently built into the lanterns as well as the physical manifestation of fear, parallax, was trapped within the Green Lantern power battery making this, in essence, a built-in weakness. One that would also serve to consume Hal Jordan, who would ultimately become corrupted by fear and then later be possessed by Parallax as a result. Number six, hold your breath. This was once a weakness that ruled over Kitty Pride, aka Catherine or Kate Pride's mutant powers. Initially, Kate could only phase so long as she was holding her breath which prevented her from phasing indefinitely. However, as time went on, Kate would learn how to manipulate the air in her lungs, which meant that she was eventually free from this weakness, making her a lot more OP today than she once was. Although in my heart, Kate has always been OP, even when she had to hold her breath. <laughs> At number five is Harley Quinn. Here's a classic tale of the underdog triumphing over the mighty, a narrative that twists but keeps us all on the edge of our seats. Enter Harley Quinn, the clown princess of crime, character more known for her maniac laughter and colorful antics than her superhuman abilities. In a spiraling turn of events, Harley manages to defeat none other than the Man of Steel himself, Superman. This unlikely showdown occurred in a series of comic books where extraterrestrial forces coerce Superman into a boxing match against Harley Quinn. They journey to the Fortress of Solitude where Superman's powers were temporarily drained. In a moment of sheer audacity, Harley swung a punch that sent Superman reeling, rendering him unconscious. It's a testament to the unpredictable nature of comic book storytelling where even the mightiest heroes can be humbled by their seemingly inferior adversaries. So as they say in Gotham, how do you like that, Puddin? At number four is Killer Frost. A villain more known for her chilling presence than her formidable powers managed to pull off an incredible upset when she faced against the Man of Steel himself, Superman. In a grand showdown of Justice League vs. The Squad, it seemed like another routine battle for the Justice League. They were dominating until the Enchantress entered the fray, incapacitating Superman with her mystic powers. But here's where it gets interesting. Amanda Waller, the mastermind behind the squad, gave the order and Frost absorbed Superman's life force. 
In that fleeting moment, she transcended her status as a weaker villain. And suddenly, she possessed strength to dispose not just Superman, but the entire Justice League. At number three is Dr. Light. In a world of superheroes and supervillains, it's not always about raw power and brute force. In case in point, Superman the Man of Steel has faced numerous foes, but some of his most astonishing defeats come at the hands of seemingly weaker villains who wielded something even more potent, intelligence. Take Dr. Light, for example. In a mind-mending twist, this villain managed to outwit the invulnerable Superman. See, rather than relying on sheer physical might, Dr. Light used cunning and manipulation. He hypnotized the Man of Steel into a state where he was willing to commit the unthinkable, unaliving himself. But it wasn't just as straightforward as it sounds. To pull off this audacious scheme, Dr. Light cleverly had Superman search for a seemingly innocuous magic wand. Little did Supes know that the seemingly harmless item would become his downfall. Dr. Light, once Superman had given it to him had used that very wand to end him. That even in the realm of superheroes and villains, brains can often peril over brawn. At number two, Superman's lead super suit. Superman is known for his powers and intelligence, but he once fell victim to a rather embarrassing defeat. Lex Luthor, his arch nemesis, took advantage of Superman's apparent lack of facial recognition skills. He disguised himself, just with a wig, and somehow the Kryptonian superhero failed to see through the ruse. Superman actually accepted a costume design sold by Luthor in disguise. The suit was encased in lead, because Superman can't see through lead. But unbeknownst to the hero, that lead concealed the dreaded kryptonite his Achilles heel. Luther planned for the lead to erode away, exposing the kryptonite at just the right moment, weakening Superman when he least expected it. I mean, I don't know how Superman didn't see this coming. I mean, the suit just screamed trap with its bright yellow and purple design, complete with a green box that boldly proclaimed your name. It's a cautionary tale of overlooking the obvious, a lesson even the mightiest heroes can learn from. And at number one is Alfred Pennyworth beats up Superman. Yeah, that's right. Alfred Pennyworth, the unassuming butler of Bruce Wayne, often flies under the radar in the superhero realm, yet his unyielding determination and surprising resourcefulness has allowed him to claim a remarkable victory against one of the most iconic superheroes of all time. In the Injustice comic series, Superman, consumed by a ruthless quest for control, infiltrates the Batcave with the intent to incapacitate Superman. And with the Dark Knight left vulnerable and on the brink of defeat, Alfred steps into the ring. Now, Alfred is armed with the strength strength-enhancing super substance that he got from Lex Luthor, of course, and after consuming which, he wages a relentless assault on the Man of Steel. In a shocking turn of events, Alfred headbutts Superman, breaking the hero's nose, and proceeds to pummel him mercilessly, driving his face into the unforgiving floor. The surprising triumph stands as a testament to Alfred's unwavering dedication to protecting his surrogate family, showcasing that even the mightiest of superheroes can suffer humiliating defeats at the hands of seemingly weaker opponents. So the next time you're pondering the hero-villain dynamic, remember that raw strength isn't the only key to victory. Sometimes it's the unexpected, the cunning, and the strategic that can topple even the mightiest of caped crusaders. Number 10, Detective Chimp. Detective Chimp might just be a chimp who also isn't necessarily known for his fighting prowess and strength, but he's also also an extremely intelligent chimp who is considered to be one of the greatest detectives Earth actually has. Not only that, but he's also been tied to the realm of mysticism after he gained the Sword of Night. And friends, before I move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, be sure to let us know that you love us by clicking that like button. Seriously, it feeds the algorithm. Feed the algorithm. Number nine, Forge. Forge is kind of squishy in comparison to some other physically tougher and more durable heroes out there, which is why he makes our cut here. And he's not particularly well known for his fighting prowess, but he is well known for making cool stuff, especially cool weapons. And because of that, he is actually extremely useful. Many also forget that Forge has experience with shamanism and not only has a mutant origin, but an origin that is also attached to the world of magic and mysticism, which honestly is pretty cool. However, for those who want to argue that Forge could march in there alongside someone like Cyclops, I think he'd actually prefer to outfit someone like Cyclops to march into action in his stead, but super souped up so that Psych alone could stand in for a whole small army of heroes and of course Forge himself. Be like, I'll just make you super cool, you go in there, and then it's basically like there's two of us because you're gonna be that cool. Number eight, Fury. This version of Fury we're focusing on here is mainly known by the name of Lita Hall. This version of the character had her origin changed following the events of Crisis on Infinite Earths. Instead of being Diana Prince, Wonder Woman, and Steve Trevor's daughter, she would become known as the daughter of Helena Cosmatos, also Fury, who was raised instead by Admiral Derek Trevor and Miss America, aka Joan Dale Trevor. In the Sandman universe, she was once the partner of Hector Hall, 
and the two are going to have a child together when Hector tragically dies. While dead in the real world, Hector's consciousness becomes suspended in a pocket of the dreaming, with Brute and Glob turning him into their new Sandman after Dream's imprisonment. Lita is visited by Hector in her dreams and eventually chooses to stay with him there, but because their child is conceived in the dreaming, he ends up being claimed by the dream lord Morpheus once he himself returns. He forces Hector's spirit to move on and explains that one day he will come for Lita's child, who belongs to the dreaming. Despite her Amazonian like abilities, Lita can be seen as weak in the traditional superhero sense, as she doesn't act as a hero in Neil Gaiman's Sandman series and instead attempts to pursue a simple, normal life with her son. However, she gets insane anxiety when it comes to being separated from him at any moment because of Dream's threat to one day claim him. Number 7. Dazzler Dazzler is here not because of how weak she seems, but because of how truly incredible her powers are. The only thing that really makes her seemingly useless is the fact that Alison Blair typically prefers to use her powers for her performances as opposed to being, you know, the team leader for the X-Men, which honestly, she easily could be and actually has been in regards to multiversal teams that exist. She's played the role of leader before, both with her band and with her fellow mutant heroes, but not for the main X-Men team. No, no, no. Dazzler has powers that have been described before to be potentially unlimited in terms of just how much damage she could do. She can transmute sound into light, and while her light shows in her concerts might seem kind of tame, she has also used her power set to defeat and defend against heavy hitters like Ulysses Claw, who she permanently defeated, Enchantress, and the Hulk. Number 6. Witchfire I think Witchfire is a super cool hero. She not only looks cool, but she also is a magical hero, one of the most powerful kinds out there if you ask me. One of them. Not, not the only one, but definitely one of my tops. But still, among those who are gifted with magic, Witchfire's Rebecca Carstairs usually ends up being regarded as lower on the totem pole. I'm sure there are actually many of you out there who aren't even familiar with this character. And to show how tragically weak she is, shortly after her first appearance in the Prime Earth continuity, she's permanently defeated, with her soul ending up being trapped after the complete destruction of her physical body. Pretty tragic, really, because I just feel like she's so cool. How could you do her like that? Halfway through into number five, breathing. If I said Batman versus Hulk, I think we should all agree, unless you're in denial on the outcome, right? Talk about a one-sided fight. Batman standing up to Superman is one thing. They share a universe, he can get kryptonite, whatever. But Batman and the Hulk, no. Unfortunately though, they have gone toe to toe and surprisingly, Batman achieved the impossible feat of defeating Hulk. In the harmonious days of 1981, when DC and Marvel were on friendly terms and the concept of separate universes hadn't really come to fruition, they occasionally collaborated on crossover stories. One such amusing tale unfolded in DC's special series number 27, written by the late Len Wein and illustrated by Jose Luis Garcia Lopez. In the extraordinary encounter, Batman unexpectedly crossed paths with a rampaging Hulk, manipulated by the Joker to view Batman as a villain. The Hulk turned his fury towards the Cape Crusader, and Batman, recognizing the immense power of his opponent, somehow skillfully evaded Hulk's fists with every move, because you know, one hit would kill him. With calculated precision, Batman then deployed a pellet of knockout gas, which was disorienting the Hulk, but you know, not knocking him out because it's the Hulk. Exploiting a moment of weakness, Batman incapacitated the Jade Giant by kicking him in the gut, forcing Hulk to inhale. That's right. Yeah, Batman kicked Hulk in the gut and actually made him flinch. Number four, Asbestos. Johnny Storm, the Human Torch, was one of my favorite superheroes as a kid. He can create, absorb, and manipulate fire, which is pretty awesome. His Nova Flame is hot enough to vaporize the particles of anything in his way, except of course for Asbestos. Now, thankfully, in our modern world, we know that asbestos is pretty incredibly toxic and it's totally banned across most of the world. But you see, back when the Human Torch was first created in 1963, it was used to insulate pipes and wires, soundproof rooms, and even make cheap garden furniture. And the Human Torch was wide open to asbestos based attacks. Specifically, though, the Torch has found himself going up against villains based on the stuff Asbestos Lady and Asbestos Man. Both of these villains made use of asbestos based outfits or armor and tools of the trade. But like I said, we know this stuff to be incredibly toxic, but we didn't know that then. So as time went on, Asbestos Lady, aka Victoria Murdoch, passed on from idiopathic mesothelioma at age 45, presumably from asbestos exposure, and Asbestos Man was forced to start wearing an oxygen mask and presumably also passed on due to 
his asbestos exposure. I guess they also had a weakness to the stuff, huh? RIP, RIP in the chat. Getting close to the end of number three, bullets. Now, with the Flash being the fastest man alive, you'd expect him to, you know, be able to react to things. And while this weakness isn't exactly showcased with the Scarlet Speedster in a meaningful way, it is certainly demonstrated well by his counterpart, the Reverse Flash. Imagine our surprise when Reverse Flash ends up getting popped in the head by none other than Thomas Wayne in the Flashpoint timeline so that Barry could access enough speed force to save the world and bring his son back. Batman shot Reverse Flash in the head. And while this apparently killed Thawne, um, that was far from the end of the story, because Thawne started vibrating as fast as he could to slow the destruction of his brain. This gave him more time to avoid death and gave him the ability to hold a grudge. But seriously, shooting a speedster in the head has to be one of the dumbest ways a speedster has been defeated. And that's including the entirety of the Flash TV series, even the final season where he shakes hands with the negative speed force. Number two, yellow. Never eat the yellow snow. It's a rule that a lot of us know. While that may be a statement made to stop small children from consuming human or animal pee, I think it would be a perfect saying to introduce into the Green Lantern Corps. How Jordan has protected the Earth from interplanetary threats with his incredibly powerful ring and his incredibly powerful will. And yet, you face him armed with a handful of buttercups and he is rendered practically useless. According to the comics, an impurity in the ring's power source meant that Jordan became powerless when faced with the color yellow. This was later expanded by Jeff Johns' Green Lantern Rebirth as being tied to Parallax, a yellow fear entity who was locked in the central power battery, thus weakening it. Now, when you say it like that, it begins to make, I guess, a little a little bit more sense, but before this was revealed though, Green Lantern's weakness was just dumb. And it still kind of is. This is no more evident than in All-Star Batman and Robin by Frank Miller. Specifically issue number 9 when the Cape Crusader trapped Hal Jordan in a yellow painted room and let a yellow suited Robin go to town on him. And this is all because it's the dumbest weakness we have ever heard of. Bruce Wayne said it himself, so it has to be true. And it was all yellow. <laughs> and finally in a number 1, Wood. Wow, look at that. Green Lantern number 1 and number 2. Throughout the years, Green Lantern has encountered various weaknesses is tied to his powers, okay? Like, yellow. But one particular vulnerability has been overlooked by most comic writers, mostly because it's specific to the Alan Scott version. Green Lanterns, they use their powers, they use them to fly, communicate in different languages, create energy constructs, or will constructs, I guess, because, you know, green. But, you know, you have to balance it out somehow. So, uh, in Alan Scott's case, wood was the chosen weakness. It has an explanation, and it stems from the subconscious belief that his abilities couldn't affect the material, and that's literally it. He didn't have the belief that he could do anything to Wood, so he couldn't. Which just showcases that belief is the most powerful superpower of all. Unless you're facing against a number two pencil, which I guess would actually take out both of them. Number 10, Spider-Man. Spider-Man is generally known for being one of the most powerful and most iconic heroes out there, but even he has his weaknesses. In fact, while many of them are not as famous as he is, some of them are pretty ridiculous, including his weakness to ethyl chloride, something that also slows and weakens spiders in the natural world. So if you were ever wondering if there might be a bug spray that you could use to fight against Spider-Man, the answer is actually kinda yes. Although make sure you bring a big spray can of ethyl chloride, as he is a lot bigger than your average spider. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you are loving what we are doing here at Top 10 Nerd, why not hit that subscribe button. It really helps us out and you get more of our content. So yay. Number nine, Superman. Superman is a character that we generally associate with strength, but not often weakness, which is interesting considering that he actually has quite a few weaknesses, probably the weirdest among them being magic. The best way to defeat Superman would simply be to become a magic user because against them he becomes kind of powerless. When it comes to the explanation for why, a lot of people's theories surrounding this have to do with the fact that Superman's powers are naturally occurring, not magic based themselves. Although this is usually used as a means to weaken him in the comics as he doesn't have a natural means to defend against against magic, and it's one of the few things like kryptonite that his invulnerability does not protect him from. In fact, narratively speaking, this is likely why he was made weak to magic to begin with, to help give him more to struggle against as a character, as he's kinda OP usually. Number 8, Rogue. Rogue was one of my favorite characters growing up, and I think what I loved about her so much was the tragedy of her story and her powers. But what's even more, I love the way that Rogue overcame them. Still, this would be 
be a terrible weakness to have or have had, so that's why I'm including Rogue on our list. Rogue's powers allow her to adopt the powers of whoever she comes into physical contact with, actually taking their powers for herself, basically draining them. But that's not all Rogue takes with her touch. She can also take your memories and drain your life force. Or at least, you know, she could do that. Rogue has since overcome this weakness by facing her fears. As it turns out, it was her own subconscious that was basically making it manifest. Number 7. Wonder Woman One of Wonder Woman's original weaknesses seems to be in line with what she represents as a character, female power and strength. As an Amazon, Wonder Woman was initially also susceptible to losing her strength and power if she was ever restrained by a man. While some might see this as kind of a sexist weakness in the comics, I would actually see it as kind of being the opposite. To me, it's more meant to symbolize a history of oppression against women and its consequences. At least, that's how I see that weakness. However, regardless of any greater meaning behind it, it was also a pretty silly weakness in the sense that it made Wonder Woman fairly easy to defeat under certain circumstances. And you know, if she was going up against men because if they just found her bracelets, that's kind of it. So I do have to say I'm glad this is no longer a rule for her in the comics today. Number 6. Nightcrawler Well, Nightcrawler is a super powerful character overall and an iconic and amazing character as well. He isn't actually the most powerful teleporter. This has to do with his weird restrictions and weaknesses surrounding teleportation. The big one being that he can only teleport by a max distance of about, I believe, two miles at a time. Uh, the other main one being the more that he teleports, the more exhausted he gets. And Curtis, a teleporter, can tire fairly quickly if he's forced to make multiple jumps, which if he has to go far, he kind of has to do because each jump he can only go so far. Kurt does teleport through the brimstone dimension, which I saw some people in the comics bringing up as like a super powerful thing. But this is actually more how his teleportation skills work. It's not necessarily something he's choosing to do, as he has to travel through the brimstone dimension to get where he's going. So while yes, he can travel interdimensionally, it's only one dimension and it's not really by choice, it's more by design. However, Kurt is an amazing character because of his limitations. That's what makes him so great. It means that when Kurt has to push it to save the day, and he often of course does just that because he really is a hero, he's often putting his life on the line for ideals he believes in or for all of Earth or all of life itself, whatever he's defending. That's why we love Kurt. Number 5. Snowbird Can't Leave Canada When the Inuit goddess of the Northern Lights, Nelvana, needed an agent on Earth to help prevent the return of the evil mystical great beasts, she mated with a human and had the shaman, Michael Two Young Men, use his magic to help deliver the child on Earth. Naria was given a decent grab bag of powers, the most notable of which is the ability to transform into any creature found in the Canadian Arctic. She has used this power to become owls, bears, and even whales, which makes her a form formidable force against her enemies. However, due to Shaman not being specific enough when casting the spell that bound her spirit to the land, she is somewhat limited in where she can go. If Snowbird goes or is taken beyond the Canadian borders, she grows weak and sick. The longer she is out of Canada, the weaker she gets, and if she stays out of the country too long, she could even die. This weakness was discovered in Alpha Flight number 12 when the team learned that their leader, Guardian, had walked into a trap set by the evil Omega Flight in New York and teleported to his location to try and save him. Snowbird immediately became emaciated and old and nearly died, and was therefore more of a hindrance than a help in this scenario. Snowbird died in a later comic and was eventually brought back, and as a result this weakness seems to have disappeared, as she has since travelled outside of Canada and has even left the planet without any ill effects. Number 4. Martian Manhunter and His Addiction John Jones is an alien from the planet Mars who has insanely strong telepathic powers that allow him to read and control minds. He also has super strength and the ability to shapeshift, and the ability to become intangible and phase through objects, making him a very difficult hero to defeat. For many years, Martian Manhunter had a psychosomatic weakness to fire that would cause him to lose the use of his powers and be burned. This weakness is kind of a problem when you consider how many superhero battles result in buildings or cars catching on fire, but what I want to focus on is a lesser known weakness, his cookie addiction. In Martian Manhunter Volume 2, Number 24, we learn that John has developed an intense love of Choco's cookies, the DC equivalent to Oreos. When Blue Beetle and Booster Gold decide to play a prank on him by stealing his cookies and buying all the Chocos in a mile radius, we learn that when Martian Manhunter goes too long without his fix, he becomes a mindless Hulk-like creature who angrily smashes up the city, screaming about how he needs his cookies. His rampage isn't stopped until Booster 
gold and blue beetle lead him to a warehouse full of chocos where he greedily begins to devour them. Once Manhunter is back to normal, Batman discovers that the chemicals in chocos, though relatively harmless to human biology, are extremely addictive to Martian physiologies. So yeah, fire is a bad weakness, but a cookie dependency issue is way worse. Number 3. Domino suffers from electorophobia. Nina Thurman has the mutant ability to subconsciously manipulate probability when she finds herself in stressful or dangerous situations in order to give herself the best possible outcome. In simpler terms, she's extremely lucky. If she is shot at, she will instinctively know exactly the right way to duck and dodge her way past the bullets, or the enemy's gun might simply jam. She can make the highly improbable happen in order to survive almost any situation, and it has made her a very difficult character to defeat, but not impossible. In Deadpool Volume 4 Number 17, the Merc with a Mouth is planning on assassinating one of the X-Men's most vocal critics in order to earn a place on the team. The X-Men of course do not want to be embroiled in this kind of scandal and send Domino to deal with Deadpool. She ties him to a bed and the two talk with Wade confessing that he is terrified of cows and Domino revealing that she is terrified of chickens. You'd think she was kidding or lying, but later in the issue when Deadpool escapes and goes after the target again, Domino and Wolverine chase after him only to be taken out of commission when crawling through an air vent when they end up face to face with a chicken. Domino is paralyzed with fear and unable to continue on, which delays her and Wolverine long enough for Deadpool to get away. Considering how much poultry seems to affect her, Domino is lucky she doesn't come across them more often. Number 2. Monel and Lead One day, when Superman was just a young super boy, he looked to the sky and saw a crashing rocket. He intercepted it and discovered a young man inside with a locket from Clark's Kryptonian parents, Jor-El and Lara Lorvan, wishing him luck on his travels. The young man had suffered amnesia, but the fact that he had the same powers as Superboy led Clark to deduce that this was his long-lost brother from Krypton. He named him Monel, and the two began fighting crime together while enjoying their newfound sense of family. However, Superboy soon became suspicious of his new brother, as Krypto didn't seem to recognize him, and his belt was made from a metal not found on Krypton's periodic table. As he did a lot in the Silver Age, Clark began putting Monel through a series of elaborate and convoluted tests to prove he was an imposter. He took a bunch of lead balls and painted them green before throwing them into space. He then went to a nearby planet with Monel to play baseball. When the green balls showed up, Superboy pretended they were kryptonite meteors and pretended to be affected. When Monel also began acting sick, Clark took this as proof that he was an imposter, but as Monel's amnesia wore off, he revealed that he was actually from the planet Daxum and had met Jor-El on his travels. As a Daxamite, he had the same powers as Superboy but really did have a vulnerability to lead. While a Kryptonian would return to full health when Kryptonite was removed, a Daxamite exposed to lead was doomed to a slow and painful death. Superboy was forced to put Monel in the Phantom Zone until he could find a cure. Monel has had a few adventures since then as a member of the Legion of Superheroes, but the fact that he could be killed by a relatively common element is pretty dumb. Number one, Aquaman gets dehydrated. As the son of a human and an Atlantean, Arthur Curry is capable of some pretty astounding feats. He is able to survive underwater and swim at incredible speed. He has super strength and expert fighting skills, as well as the ability to control the oceans when wielding the trident of Poseidon. Oh, and he can also talk to and control fish, an ability that might seem lame until he attacks you with a megalodon. However, he also has a weakness that is pretty silly. If Aquaman doesn't go back in the water every hour, he begins to grow weak and dehydrated. The severity of this weakness depends on who is writing the comic and what continuity you're in, but the Silver Age version of this character was particularly vulnerable. A great example of this is in Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen number one. 115, when Jimmy developed the same powers as Aquaman. A villain impersonating Superman was able to trick Aquaman and Jimmy into entering a competition where they stayed out of the water for an hour and then crawled through the desert trying not to die, as the fake Superman taunted them with a pitcher of water. For those wondering, Jimmy won the competition and was made the new King of Atlantis. After they defeated the villain, he ceded the throne back to Aquaman, but the fact that Jimmy beat him in a nefarious but fair competition, and by rights is the true King of Atlantis, makes you realize why Aquaman has so much trouble being taken seriously. Number 10, Martian Manhunter and Fire. Now I'm not gonna lie, I am also not the biggest fan of fire either, and I would absolutely hate being set on fire for so many reasons. But for such a powerful hero who can shapeshift at a molecular level, change his entire genetic makeup to let him pass through solid objects, withstand ferocious attacks, or bend light waves around his body, it just seems a little silly, right? Not to mention that he comes from Mars, otherwise known as the Red Planet or the Fire Star. 
So why is this one of his biggest weaknesses? Well, long before Martian Manhunter even existed, a race of aliens known as the Burning caused some serious damage with fire in order to create their offspring, which, needless to say, people weren't too happy about. After the Guardians of the Universe separated the offspring into the White Martians and the Green Martians, they were all imbued with a congenital pyrophobia, aka a fear of fire. So it kind of makes sense why he's so afraid of it. Not only does it physically hurt him, but it also scrambles his most prized weapon of all, his mind. This fear and weakness is so intense that when he's exposed to flame, he has the capacity to self-destruct, either combusting into bits or dissolving into rivers of Martian liquid. Want to know more about the Martian Manhunter? Well then check him out in his first appearance in 1986's Justice League of America, number 255. Number 9, The Flash and Being Too Fast. At first, I've got to say this one confused me so much because that's kind of the Flash's whole thing, right? Well, when it comes to Barry Allen, his speed might be his greatest strength, but being too fast puts his life in mortal danger. In Crisis on Infinite Earths, we see the Flash use his super speed to thwart the Anti-Monitor's evil plan, but the speed vortex he creates to stop the villain's antimatter cannon from firing is so fast that it sweeps the Flash away along with it. He ends up being stranded for 23 years in the Speed Force, you know, that mystical energy field that gives all the speeds through their powers, and spends that whole time running and trying to figure out how to get back. Basically, what happened is that Barry ran way too fast for his body to handle and he atomized himself. Thought to be dead by his closest friends, including Wally West, who took up the Flash mantle in his absence, Barry's apparent death was a huge shock for everyone, and also entirely his own fault. Check out more of The Flash for yourself, starting with his first appearance in 1956's Showcase, number 4. Number 8, Power Girl and Raw Materials. You'd think that being weak to Kryptonite would be their only weakness, considering how easy it seemed for people to get their hands on it. But Kara Zor L from Earth 2 actually had another pretty big weakness at one point. They were vulnerable to unprocessed natural materials such as branches and rocks for a short while. This also includes stone, dirt, and sand. Basically anything that can be found on Earth that isn't man-made. In Peter David's Supergirl Volume 4 number 16, she gets knocked to the ground and impaled by a pretty big tree branch, which in her defense would put anyone on the ground. Supergirl helps yank out the branch, and with this weirdly sociopathic smile on her face, she asks, what, are you vulnerable to wood? It took a second, but after she was no longer in pain, she replied, worse, to any raw, unprocessed natural materials. So, sticks and stones really can break my bones. <sighs> God, dumb joke and even dumber weakness. Check her out for yourself in her first appearance in 2011's Flashpoint, Volume 2, Number 5. Number 7, Adam Strange and Forced Deportation. Who knew that archaeologists could also be superheroes? Well, apparently Adam Strange did because that is exactly what he is. He inadvertently found himself on the planet Ran and was gifted with all the powers of a superhero in mystery and space. And it's not exactly explained why. Sounds pretty great, right? I mean, what could possibly be his weakness? Well, it's not actually his fault or in his control. This life of bliss he lives on Ran is frequently interrupted by his rather inconvenient transportations back to Earth, where he has no powers at all. The technology responsible for bringing him to Ran, the Zeta Beam, only allows him to remain there for as long as it's transmitting back to Earth. And as it takes the Beam a few good years to reach Strange's home planet, it's not exactly easy to catch a ride back. Strange might have been recruited as Rand's savior, but his timing issues really make this role more of a temporary gig. He could be midway through his heroics before vanishing without a single trace. He even left his wife to nearly get eaten by a tiger once. Luckily, as Alan Moore's Swamp Thing series clarified, the Randians are more than capable of looking after themselves when Strange isn't around, and thank goodness for that because I wouldn't be relying on Strange much either. Give his story a read for yourself, starting with 1986's Outsiders, number 6. Number 6, Human Torch and Asbestos. Now, don't get me wrong, Johnny Storm, aka the Human Torch, is a force to be reckoned with. Not only can he create, absorb, and manipulate fire, which is pretty awesome on its own, but his Nova Flame is hot enough to vaporize the particles of anything in his way, whether it's a bullet, a building, a bad guy, etc. Interestingly enough, though, his powers can't seem to penetrate asbestos. Now, this doesn't seem like much of a weakness now, given that asbestos is now banned across most of the world, but back when the Human Torch was first created by Stanley and Ernest Hart in 1963, it was a much more common thing, as it was used to insulate pipes and wires, soundproof rooms, and even make cheap garden furniture. In Strange Tales number 111, Asbestos Man came into play, dialed up Johnny Storm, and arranged a showdown between the two. The Human Torch wasn't really all that into it, but he agreed nonetheless and showed up completely underprepared. Asbestos Man used his super asbestos suit, a fire retardant shield, and a fisherman's net to go toe to toe with the Human Torch, and he wreaked havoc on the Human Torch until he developed mesothelioma and needed an oxygen tank to stay alive. Moral of the story, kids, is always prepare for anything, and please don't breeze asbestos. 
Check out more of the Human Torch story starting with 1961's Fantastic Four, number one. At number 10 is Toy Man. Toy Man, an unexpected powerhouse to the DC universe, stands as a testament to the idea that power isn't solely defined by raw strength. His arsenal of whimsical toys may seem harmless, but they've confounded to some of the mightiest heroes, with some iconic showdowns proving his prowess. In the Justice League animated series, Toy Man took on the Man of Steel himself, armed with a giant robot wielding a disintegrating beam. He used it and targeted Batman and Wonder Woman, but it was Superman, the embodiment of strength, who introduced Intervene. With unwavering heroism, he sacrificed himself, intercepting the beam that vanquished him instantly, leaving no trace behind. This momentous clash underscores that power that isn't always about brute force. Toy Man's genius and unpredictability outwitted Superman, reminding us that even the most potent heroes can fall before unconventional adversaries. At number 9, Wolverine loses to a couple of dudes. Wolverine, the indomitable mutant known for his regenerative powers, faced a stunning defeat at the hands of mere agents. This pivotal loss occurred during his dark past as part of the Weapon X program, aka like his origin story. These agents didn't possess any superhuman strength or extraordinary abilities, but they just wielded advanced technology, including a stun gun. In a dramatic encounter, the agents ambushed Wolverine, shooting him with a stun gun. Though Logan, with his exceptional healing factor, attempted to resist, the electric shock disrupted his powers temporarily, and consequently, he was incapacitated and whisked away into the nefarious laboratory for the notorious adamantium bonding process. This episode this episode serves as a stark reminder that even the most powerful superheroes can fall victim to cunning tactics and advanced weaponry, emphasizing the vulnerability that often accompanies extraordinary abilities in the world of comics. If you're enjoying this video so far, by the way, you can support the channel by pressing like, subscribing to Top 10 Nerd, and ringing that notification bell. At number 8, the Joker. The Joker's ability to topple superheroes while struggling against Batman is indeed perplexing. It raises questions about the power dynamics within the DC universe. Batman's unbreakable will and intellect have often been weapons against the Crown Prince of Crime, but it seems like the Joker has an eerie knack for unsettling even the Man of Steel. In the Emperor Joker storyline, the Joker's cunning manipulation of reality through Mr. Pitylix's powers leads to Superman's imprisonment in Arkham Asylum, a shocking outcome. And furthermore, the Injustice Saga reveals a another sinister chapter where Joker's deception pushes Superman to the brink, resulting in Lois Lane's death and Metropolis's annihilation at Superman's hands. Perhaps it's the unpredictability of chaos embodied by the Joker that makes him a formidable adversary, even for the mighty Superman. The complexities of hero-villain dynamics in the DC Universe continue to baffle and intrigue fans. At number 7 is Lex Luthor. In the sprawling tapestry of superhero rivalries, none have endured quite like the clash between Superman and his arch-nemesis, Lex Luthor. Their epic confrontations have etched themselves into the annals of comic book lore, yet what makes this rivalry truly fascinating are the moments when the mighty Man of Steel faltered against his seemingly lesser opponent. He doesn't have any power, man. One such instance borders on the absurd, Lex Luthor's conquest over cancer. In an astonishing turn of events, Luthor uncovered a cure for this devastating disease. Crafty as ever, he ensnared Superman with a devious trap fueled by kryptonite. In a single fateful exchange, Lex emerged victorious. A bittersweet triumph for sure, but this one showcases the complexity of this age-old rivalry. Sorry Clark, but even a hero as iconic as you can't compete with curing cancer. At number 6, the ultimates beat Thor. In the vast and intricate tapestry of superhero lore, there exists moments where the seemingly invincible stumble before adversaries who appear on the surface vastly inferior. The second ultimate storyline plunges us into such conundrum, where the Earth's mightiest heroes, the Avengers, find themselves ensnared in a treacherous web of deception spun by the mischievous Loki. Thor, the god of thunder wielding Mjolnir with unwavering might, stands as an emblem of power, and yet in this narrative, he's compelled to engage in a heart-wrenching battle against his comrades, manipulated by Loki's cunning illusions. Thor's innate reluctance to harm his friends proves as his Achilles heel, and when he finally unleashes his divine fury, it's Loki Loki who engineers a twist in reality, rendering Thor powerless. This vulnerability is exploited by the Ultimates, who, with Loki's machinations, capture the godly Avenger. Number 5, Wood. Does this weakness sound ridiculous to you? Because it certainly does to me. When you think of a superhero, you usually think of someone who is capable of defeating your common run-of-the-mill criminal in a single punch. We think of beings who can fly and shoot laser beams from their eyes, who are impervious to damage from even some of the most dramatic blows. And then there is the original Green Lantern, Alan Scott, with his weakness to wood. 
Why did Alan Scott initially have this weakness? Well, there have been a few reasons that have been used in an attempt to explain this. One is that as a lantern, he was simply only invulnerable to metals. So wood was just something that wasn't a thing he was invulnerable to. Another is related to a conflict with the previous Green Lantern who wielded the lantern and was an alien who misused his powers. And as such, Alan was simply punished as a result of that previous Green Lantern's folly because he has his lantern. There was another reason that said the wood weakness came from the fact that the Green Lantern came from green glowing things and as such couldn't or wouldn't be used to do harm to its own kind, which would be wood, trees, nature, that kind of thing. Another still was explained as Alan's own fear of being knocked in the back of the head with a wooden club, which happened on his like first outing. And that was the reason why it was like a built in fear. He had to overcome it. But either way you slice it, the idea that an all powerful being like Green Lantern could be defeated with a baseball bat. It's pretty silly. Let's be real. Number four, superpowers. Iska is a super interesting character. On one hand, she is extremely powerful and can never lose. She can even potentially have her power utilized to manipulate the stakes of other competitions that she is pulled into. However, this also implies that there are times when she has zero control over her powers in the sense that she cannot influence the result of an unbalanced battle or that she can be used to give someone else a rival or even an enemy the upper hand by including her in a wager or a fight. Her powers force whatever side she is on to become victorious, regardless of whether or not she even wants that to happen. This has meant that Iska has been forced to turn her back on her own people, the mutants of Arako, more than once. She has also had to fight against family, colleagues, and friends before as a result. Which, I don't know, if you ask me, that kind of sounds like a weakness because you gotta live with that, so that would kind of suck. You always win, but at what cost? Number three, organic materials. Power Girl probably has one of the weirdest weaknesses around in comics. Despite being a Kryptonian and sometimes an Atlantean, depending on the time period and version of the character we're talking about, who is on the level of Superman when it comes to her powers and her strength, she can easily be harmed simply if you use organic materials to hurt her. You know that saying about sticks and stones may break your bones? Well, for Power Girl, despite having super durability, this is actually true. Sticks and stones could break her bones, but industrial steel probably wouldn't for some reason. Fortunately, Kara no longer has this weakness anymore, but for an embarrassing little while in the 90s, she did, so. Number two, power inhibitors. Remy LeBeau often seems to be considered an underrated X-Men. He can create massive explosions using kinetic energy, which he focuses on an object that is charged by his touch and explodes. Typically prefers playing cards just because they're fast to charge, but he could charge really big stuff if he wanted to. He also has great control over his powers, but there is something you might have noticed in the comics when it comes to his power set. He never seems to charge people or any organic life forms. What's up with that? For many, they might just think that Gambit chooses not to because, well, he's ultimately a hero. Although this rule isn't always consistently applied as sometimes writers do forget about it. But if you were wondering why, for the most part, Gambit can't charge living beings, it's actually because of Mr. Sinister. Gambit made a deal with Sinister to operate on his brain in order to help him control his powers more while also limiting them so that he doesn't basically go haywire and like kill everyone he loves. This means his own weakness in regard to the use of his abilities is actually kind of self-imposed. Number one, Red Kryptonite. Red Kryptonite has to be one of the goofiest weaknesses to have ever existed in all of comic book history. I know that's a bold statement to some, but I honestly stand by it. Why is Red Kryptonite so dumb? Well, because it's completely unpredictable. It's like chaos incarnate when it comes to Superman weaknesses. This is because it was stated that each piece of Red Kryptonite had different effects. In fact, it was also suggested that after 24 to 48 hours of a particular effect taking hold, it would subside. But if exposed to the same piece of Red Kryptonite again, a Kryptonian would become victim to a whole different side effect for some reason. But then it has also been stated that once a Kryptonian is affected by a piece of red kryptonite, that whole piece is rendered powerless and can't be used against them ever again. Basically, red kryptonite is a bundle of contradictions, mainly used as a plot device to do whatever the writer needs to do to Superman for their story. List of side effects includes, but are not limited to, power loss, turning evil, excessive hair growth, blindness to all things green, insanity, and turning into a dragon. 
Coming in at number 10 today, it's Luke Cage's impenetrable skin. Thanks to the super soldier experiment known as the Burstein process, Luke Cage Power Man does have incredible strength, stamina, and a healing factor, but he is pretty much most known for the fact that he is protected by indestructible, impenetrable, super dense skin. That is an awesome power to have. Luke is protected from almost anything with this titanium like skin, but the problem here is that this natural shield isn't just shielding him from the outside. Whenever Luke Cage is internally injured, which is rarely, the character requires more than almost anyone else ever would. It's next to impossible to perform surgery on Luke Cage unless you happen to have access to an overpowered medical laser. The natural ways someone might be healed from some kind of internal injury do not apply as doctors can't even cut through Cage's skin to begin the procedure in the first place. As you can imagine, this can be pretty problematic. In a 9 50% off sales, Captain Margaret Elizabeth or Peggy Carter was a distinguished Avenger and founding member of the Illuminati, who played a crucial role in the Infinity War of 2018 of her world, where she valiantly fought against Thanos and aided during the Battle of Titan. In the aftermath, when Doctor Strange utilized the Darkhold for dreamwalking, resulting in a multiversal threat of, you know, incursions, Carter, along with the rest of the Illuminati, voted in favor of executing him to safeguard their universe. In the years that followed, Carter found herself residing over a hearing concerning an alternate version of Doctor Strange, who was after apprehended by Baron Mordo on suspicions of posing a similar danger. Before the vote could be finalized though, to condemn this alternate Doctor Strange, their headquarters came under attack by the Scarlet Witch. Carter and her fellow Illuminati confronted her, uh, but tragically uh, she met her demise when Scarlet Witch used her own shield to cut her in half, hence the 50% off sale. The amount of times that Cap has caught his shield though makes me question why Carter was able to be cut in half by hers. Number 8. Chickens or electorophobia. The mutant Domino is pretty darn unique. Her mutant ability allows her to subliminally and psionically initiate random kinetic phenomena that affect probability in her favor by making improbable, but importantly not impossible, things to occur within her line of sight. What does that mean? Basically she has good luck. Really, really good luck. So how do you give a weakness to someone with such a strange and honestly powerful power as luck? Easy, you make her absolutely terrified of chickens. Now obviously not a lot of people are running across chickens very often and I think that holds true for superheroes, but for someone with such super powered luck as Domino, she runs into chickens more than should be acceptable. And that's pretty unlucky because her fear of chickens is quite debilitating. In its 7 chewing gum, the Justice Buster bat suit is a mech suit that's part of Batman's Fenrir contingency, which is designed to take down the entirety of the Justice League if they were to turn bad. Making its feature appearance in Batman Endgame, when the Joker used his Virus to warp the brains of the Justice League at the beginning of this endgame plot, Batman was forced to use the Fender protocol to eliminate the teammates, or well, to at least subdue them. The suit was successful in eliminating Wonder Woman, The Flash, and Aquaman, but men even matched the hands of Superman. After a lengthy fight, Superman tore through the armor and nearly killed Batman until Bruce used kryptonite chewing gum to spit in Clark's face, rendering him unconscious. Come on, okay? Imagine waking up to learn that you passed out because Batman spit on your face. Seriously, please, brush your tongue, okay? You get one of those tongue scrapers. Your breath is lethal. Not to mention the miniaturized red suns for knuckles. They didn't help. You had to spit kryptonite chewing gum. Number 6. Ethyl Chloride Ethyl Chloride, a common compound found in pesticides and bug sprays, is essentially Spider-Man's kryptonite, and it severely impairs his senses. This makes ethyl chloride extremely powerful against Spider-Man. It's one of his biggest weaknesses, but yet ethyl chloride isn't being used by all of his villains all the time, even though it's actually a very common compound. The big reason why it doesn't show up much is that ethyl chloride is considered to be so supremely powerful against Spider-Man that there was a momentary ban placed on the substance by Marvel writers. It was literally becoming too easy to bring down Spidey, so writers got lazy and used it as a crutch just way too many times. Amazing Spider-Man number 106 has Spider-Man engaging in battle with the Spider Slayer Mark IV, which had the villainous addition of ethyl chloride. After trapping Spider-Man in a web, Smythe, the guy who created it, uses his machine to douse Peter with a cloud of the compound, and Spider-Man is weakened by the spray and finds himself unable to move, giving his enemies the chance to strike. Number 5. Cypher. Cypher I'd like to rank a little bit lower on this list because calling him weak feels kind of 
unfair considering how integral he's been lately in regards to helping kickstart Krakoa, especially in the comics. But Cypher is still one of those characters that people attribute as being weak because of his power set, and so for that reason, I'm still gonna count him here. But of course, his powers actually happen to be some of the most useful in the comics. It's a kind of like a misunderstanding, especially when we consider that they also apply to Cypher being able to communicate with tech and using his ability to understand and communicate in all kinds of languages to become a skilled fighter, which has been interpreted by certain writers as its own language, so Cypher can also be great at fighting. However, not all writers seem to be able to agree on this point, because some people have also seemingly forgot that Cypher is supposed to be really great at fighting. <laughs> Number four, Tracy 13. Tracy 13 is a magic user who isn't as well known as others like Zatanna, John Constantine, or Dr. Fate from DC Comics. And in that regard, considering she hasn't had as much of a chance to prove herself, she could be considered weak. That being said, she still is a magic user and one who is the daughter of both a magical skeptic and a powerful sorceress, meaning that she possesses both the knowledge of when to be doubtful about someone's prowess and skills and the natural aptitude to perform magic herself, learning from her mother before her mother passed away. In the Prime Earth continuity, the type of magic that Tracy uses is actually known as urban magic, which allows her to fuel her abilities through the power and spirit of sprawling and built up cities. Personally, I also think that's just like a super cool like niche magic thing, urban magic. Number three, dupe. Unsurprisingly, yes, a lot of seemingly weak heroes who actually happen to have pretty impressive powers come from the mutant camp of Marvel Comics. Although I don't know if it's ever actually been cemented exactly what dupe is at all, whether that be mutant or something else entirely. Maybe an alien, who knows. However, dupe has definitely found a home with the mutant, so I think we'd still consider him to be an honorary mutant at the very least if we wanted. Dupe has to be one of the weirdest characters of all time, especially when it comes to his storylines. Dupe is also weirdly romantic for a floating green alien language speaking creature that was possibly created as a result of government experimentation. Kind of looks like a jelly bean. Yet also somehow he has a mother. Dupe is a ridiculous character, but when he needs to, he seems to be able to exhibit almost any superpower one could think of. Number two, Booster Gold. Booster Gold could be considered weak because his powers aren't even really powers that he was born with or incurred from a wacky lab accident gone wrong or like worked really hard to earn like abilities, but instead are fueled by technology that he stole in the future, which is where, or rather when, he's from the future. He used tech to travel to the past and with his knowledge of the past as well, aimed to become a hero in that time period. There, Booster used his tech as well as his knowledge from the future to try and become a hero. And well, he succeeded, hooray. However, just because Booster can do things like time travel doesn't mean he's always the best at heroics. Case in point, the time he tried to give a gift to Batman and Catwoman in honor of their wedding. His gift was to travel back in time and prevent Bruce's parents from being lost to him all those years ago. But in so doing this also prevented Bruce and Selena from ever getting together and also caused well a lot of other problems. I mean Batman wouldn't be Batman without that loss right? Potentially. Yes, actually, I think that story confirmed that. Number one, Squirrel Girl. Squirrel Girl is one of my all-time favorite heroes, even if some out there consider her to be weak sauce. Not me, though. I see her true strength, but I can't ignore the fact that on paper, her powers, her mutation, well, it all does sound pretty ridiculous. And she should, by all intents and purposes, not be as OP as we know her to be. However, that being said, I feel like we need to acknowledge the fact that Doreen's abilities, or more specifically, her people skills, are honestly insanely powerful. Squirrel Girl has the ability to befriend pretty much anyone, no matter their alignment. And she is really, and I mean, really good at helping convince criminals to call it quits, either for the day or Honestly, for like the rest of their entire lives. Number 10, Batman's inability to trust. For a superhero with no powers, Batman is able to do remarkably well against much more powerful villains and is able to stand next to some of the most powerful heroes in the DC Universe without looking out of place. And while yes, technically you could count the fact that he's susceptible to being shot or stabbed as a weakness, his greatest weakness is his inability to trust anyone, even his closest allies. Batman is constantly finding himself in situations where he doesn't give his allies the full picture and as a result, he or 
his teammates are put in unnecessary danger. The most famous example of this comes from the Tower of Babel storyline, when it was revealed that Batman had developed detailed plans about how to destroy each of his friends and teammates. Ra's al Ghul managed to steal these plans and do a lot of damage to the heroes before Batman realized what was happening. Frankly, it is only through dumb luck that none of the League members were killed in this incident. When the dust settled, the team was furious with Batman for breaching their trust and putting all of them in danger. As the writer of the story, Mark Wade, recently said in an interview where he talked about this arc, Batman's sin to the Justice League was not that he had these plans to counteract each of them. It was that he didn't tell them. If he had just said to Superman, listen, just in case you want to know, I have a backup in case you ever go nuts. Superman would go, awesome, that's good to hear. This is a lesson that Batman has yet to really absorb, despite the amount of times his secrecy has blown up in his face, such as when he kept the Batman Who Laughs prisoner under the Hall of Justice without telling anyone. Number 9. Zatanna Has to Be Able to Speak Zatanna is a stage magician who happens to be capable of real magic. She is capable of casting powerful enchantments that can range from turning enemies into rabbits or a Erasing their memories. She casts these spells by saying what she wants backwards. For example, when she wants to turn rain into flowers, she says Niar Semo Keb Suru Wolf. The one limitation on this power is that to cast these spells, she has to be able to speak the incantations. So, unlike other magic wielding characters like, say, Doctor Strange, who could cast a spell by wordlessly waving their hands, if someone manages to gag Zatanna, she is incapable of doing anything to further defend herself. As happened when she was captured by the Joker, who slit her throat and threw her into a water tank. However, she was eventually able to heal herself by using blood magic and writing the spell backwards in her own blood. Number 8. Daredevil's radar sense gets confused When Matt Murdock was a young boy, he was hit by a truck that was carrying a radioactive isotope. This isotope got in his eyes and blinded him, but also heightened his other senses, allowing him to develop his trademark radar sense, which helps him navigate the world and fight crime as Daredevil. While this does give him several advantages, it is also prone to being overstimulated by kinda random things. For example, if he ends up underwater, he can easily lose his bearings and have trouble telling up from down. Even worse though is his weakness to rain. This weakness is kinda inconsistent, as in other versions of the character like the Ben Affleck movie, rain allows him to see things more clearly, but in the comics it is a serious handicap for the character. In issue 25 of the 2011 Daredevil series, Matt is fighting a villain named Ikari who has a similar radar sense. The fight leads them to a sporting goods store where Matt's narration reveals that he has always been worried that a villain will someday think to use a sprinkler system against him, as rain negates his sense of smell, overwhelms his hearing, and makes his radar sense practically useless, cutting his by 95%. Considering how often it seems to rain in Marvel's New York and how dependent Daredevil is on his radar sense, this is a pretty rough weakness. Number 7. Black Canary if she gets a sore throat Dinah Lance is the second hero to use the alias of Black Canary, with her mother being the first. While her mother was limited to being a capable hand-to-hand -hand fighter and being able to train canaries to do amazing feats, her daughter has the ability to unleash the powerful canary cry. How she manages this varies depending on the continuity, with it sometimes being a byproduct of a wizard's curse and sometimes being due to her carrying the metahuman gene. But what the power does remains consistent. The canary cry allows Dinah to control her vocal vocal cords to generate a powerful sonic attack that can deafen her opponents and when she really lets loose, can destroy metal and even kill people. However, she needs to be in good vocal health to achieve this, and if she ever has laryngitis, she is unable to unleash the canary cry. However, even without the cry, she is one of the best martial artists in the DC universe, so she still manages okay. Number 6. Wolverine's Metal Skeleton Wolverine has always been a powerful mutant, sporting claws, and a healing factor that makes him practically unkillable. Between that that and his super acute senses, his more than a century of combat training, and his berserker rage, he is not someone you want as an enemy. These abilities got an upgrade when the Weapon X program got a hold of him and coated his skeleton and claws with an indestructible metal called adamantium. While this does make him even more durable, it does come with certain drawbacks. For example, it does make it much more difficult for Wolverine to swim, and foes often take advantage of this, trapping the clawed Canadian underwater and making him experience the feeling of drowning until he manages to escape. The other drawback to this, of course, is that it makes him vulnerable to magnetism. While this wouldn't be too bad of a weakness for most heroes, I mean, how often do you really come across a giant magnet in the world? Wolverine has the misfortune of being a member of the one superhero team that is constantly fighting against a character who is able to manipulate metal with his mind. 
hand. At best, this makes him immobile for most of the encounters against Magneto, and at worst, it results in him getting his skeleton torn out. Number 5. Green Lantern Hal Jordan is Green Lantern, or one of the Green Lanterns anyways, and as a Green Lantern, he has a pretty iconic and ridiculous weakness. Or at least, for a very long time in the comics, he did have that weakness. Hal had a weakness to the color yellow. In fact, all Green Lanterns did for a while. This was as a result of Parallax existing within the Green Lantern Corps' central battery. Having the entity of fear within the battery caused all Green Lanterns to develop a weakness to yellow, something that was used in All-Star Batman and Robin and Frank Miller's alternate reality to weaken and torment Hal Jordan's Green Lantern. In the All-Star Batman and Robin comic, Batman and Robin basically paint themselves and an entire safe house yellow, just to teach Hal a lesson about meddling in Batman's affairs. Number 4. Black Cat Black Cat is an anti-hero over at Marvel Comics, who is generally known for being an ally and sometimes romantic partner of Spider-Man. While she typically is shown as being a skilled thief with acrobatic skills and superb training and experience as a fighter, at least that's how she was depicted initially, she doesn't usually have any superpowers to speak of. However, at one point, she did just have straight up powers, and this happened for Black Cat when the Kingpin granted her wish of getting them. However, because this was the Kingpin, it of course did not work out exactly as Felicia had planned. She ended up with bad luck powers, which were extremely useful when fighting an enemy, but um, not so useful when with an ally or anyone else, as they actually affected not just her opponents, but like anyone who was close to her, which means that Peter suffered from them as well. To make matters worse, Felicia kept her powers a secret from him, which ended up driving a wedge between the two when it came to their romantic and working relationships with one another. Number 3. Green Lantern Alan Scott used to have a hilarious weakness, similar to someone else on our list actually. Let me know in the comments when and if you figure out who I'm talking about here. Alan Scott had a weakness to wood. The explanation for why and how this weakness developed was explained later by the fact that Alan was snuck up on and basically attacked using a wooden club sort of, and as a result he subconsciously manifested this as a weakness of his, due to him mistaking it for one when in reality, you know, it just hurts to get smacked by a piece of wood, because that just hurts. Thankfully, Alan Scott has overcome this, and this strange weakness that was actually originally tied to being the hero Green Lantern in the comics no longer bothers Alan, or any other Green Lanterns for that matter. Number 2. Iska the Unbeaten Iska is a super interesting character. On one hand, she is extremely powerful and can never lose. She can even potentially have her power utilized to manipulate the stakes of other competitions that she's pulled into. However, this also implies that there are times when she has zero control over her power in the sense that she cannot influence the result of an unbalanced battle. In fact, her powers will pull her to serve the side that will be victorious, regardless of whether or not she wants to in terms of what her mind or her heart is saying to her. This has meant that Iska has been forced to turn her back on her own people, the mutants of Arako, more than once. She has also had to fight against family, colleagues, and friends before as a result. Although the one thing she can control at times is kind of how she approaches the fighting part part of, you know, the battle. Meaning that if she has the option, you know, she can try to fight others involved as opposed to those that she is specifically close to. Like during her fight against Planet Araco and the Great Ring when she was teleported away to the planet's ocean by Nightcrawler and chose to stay there fighting the planet's creatures in the name of Uranus and the Eternals as opposed to fighting her own people directly or continuing to fight them directly. Number 1. Power Girl Power Girl probably has one of the weirdest weaknesses around. Despite being a Kryptonian who is on the level of Superman when it comes to her powers and her strength, she can easily be harmed simply if you use organic materials to hurt her. You know that saying about sticks and stones which may break your bones? Well, for Power Girl, despite having super durability and invulnerability, this is true. Sticks and stones could break her bones, but industrial steel probably wouldn't hurt her for some reason. Raw organic materials which have been unprocessed are revealed to be a weakness of Power Girls in Supergirl issue number 16 from the 1996 series. Power Girl shares this revelation with her alternate self from the main continuity at the time, who was shocked by the revelation. Which, I mean, fair enough, I would be too if I were Linda Danvers, who was Supergirl at that time. However, I will say I don't think that Kara has this weakness anymore in the comics, thank goodness. But in the 90s, it was a thing, and it was there for some reason. Number 5. Wonder Woman and Being Tied Up Superheroes don't come much more kick than Wonder Woman. She's an extremely skilled warrior with enough power to take on the gods and win, and she's shown time and time again that she can hold her own in the world of comic book heroes. However, the Golden Age Wonder Woman was bound by an interesting Amazonian rule that really did not work in her favor. 
Known as Aphrodite's Law, it states that when an Amazon girl permits a man to chain her braces of submission together, she becomes weak as other women in a man ruled world. This gender specific weakness lasted from Wonder Woman's debut in 1942 right through to the mid 80s, when DC finally retconned this out for good. This weakness is less literal than metaphorical, meant to demonstrate Marston's argument that women are only vulnerable to men when they choose to be. But still, I am very glad that this has gotten rid of for good. Check out Wonder Woman more for yourself, starting with her first appearance in 1942's All-Star Comics, Volume 1, Number 8. Number 4, Gladiator and Self-Confidence. Cal Ark, aka Gladiator, is arguably one of the most powerful comic book heroes ever. Gifted with planet-shattering strength, super speed, heat vision, frost breath, and a few psionic abilities as well. He's a superhero anyone would love to be, however, even though he is loved, he never really learned to love himself, and that is sometimes his biggest downfall. Although low self-esteem isn't exactly fun for anyone, trust me, I know, for Gladiator it's actually a fatal weakness. His power fluctuates according to his confidence, as seen in Dan Abnett's and Andy Lanning's War of Kings crossover in 2009. Get him to doubt himself or even his abilities for one second and he can be defeated by opponents with far weaker abilities than him. A prime example of this is shown in War of Kings number 3 when Rocket Raccoon manages to convince Glider his gun will hurt himself and despite withstanding far worse in the past, succumbs to self-fulfilling prophecy and is beaten. Give his story a read for yourself starting with 1977's X-Men number 107. Number 3, Daredevil and Loud Noises. Now we all likely know this, but Matt Murdock's loss of vision took away the natural gift of eyesight that we all take for granted, and replaced it with echolocation, an uncanny radar sense that allows him to basically see things through sound. Unfortunately for many heroes, their greatest strength can also be their greatest weakness, and such is the case for Daredevil, as his extreme sensitivity to sound can completely incapacitate him. In Daredevil Volume 2 West Case Scenario, he is subjected to a high decibel ultrasound, 120 decibels to be exact, by the dastardly Purple Man. Who knows his weapon is excruciating for a man of Daredevil's gift. Daredevil's head spins and he looks like a man under a sorcerer's spell, leaving him completely vulnerable to a follow-up attack. The same can actually be done using intense smells as well, since his sense of smell was also heightened after losing his eyesight. Although Daredevil can and does go toe-to-toe -to -toe with pretty much anyone in a fight, he will get utterly emasculated by a stink bomb or a supersonic sound. Check out more of Matt Murdock for yourself, starting with his first appearance in 1964's Daredevil, number one. Loud noises! Number two, Green Lantern and Wood. If you're a bit confused, that is totally okay. This is not a weakness that is common across all of the Green Lanterns. It's specific to the very first Green Lantern, Alan Scott. Despite being armed with a magical ring and a spectrum of pretty much limitless powers, Scott seemed to have another fatal weakness other than the color yellow. He first realized that this might be a problem for him after he was hit in the face with a wooden log. And then after a series of wins and victory laps, Scott realized tree bark might be his potential undoing. Put a little more succinctly, items made of wood cannot be lifted or broken by energy from the ring, nor can barriers of emerald energy stop projectiles crafted from wood. Apparently this vulnerability to wood was because the green flame was an incarnation of green growing things, and thus could not be turned against them. Guess you could say he, uh, can't get wood. <laughs> Check out the first Green Lantern for yourself, starting with 1940's All-American Comics, number 16. Number 1, Captain Marvel Jr. and his own name. Poor, poor Freddie Freeman. Out of all of the weaknesses on this list today, he probably drew the shortest straw because his weakness is his own name. If Captain Marvel Jr. tries to introduce himself to a superpowered ally or for some reason feels the need to say his name in the middle of a battle, he'll instantly be transformed back into Freddie Freeman, a ordinary young lad who relies on a crutch to walk. Or if he speaks his superhero alias aloud in the guise of Freddie Freeman, he'll transform into a shimmering beacon of muscly justice and give himself away. Jerry Ordway tries tried getting around this flaw during Captain Marvel Jr.'s sporadic appearances in Teen Titans between 1995 and 1998 by having Freeman refer to himself as CM3, since he was one of the three members of the Captain Marvel family at the time. Also, he could avoid accidental transformations, but that change didn't really stick around. Honestly, for someone who inspired many of Elvis's onstage looks, that is one weakness that I don't know if I can overlook. Check him out for yourself in his first DC appearance in 1995's The Power of Shazam, number three. 